Hello out there, Grandmistress of Shadow Style JR here, and welcome to the theater of my mind, wherein I take story ideas from within this head of mine and share them with you so that maybe perhaps you might be entertained or enlightened in some way, give you some ideas of your own. So, um, this is actually a very special edition of this. Uh, I wasn't going to do this quite so quickly, but I kind of wanted to get this out a little quick. Uh, a little quicker than, you know, say the next week, for one very important reason. Witches of the Coast, for their fifth edition, uh, does this thing every now and again where they put out playtest information called Unearthed Arcana. Uh, it's not official content, it's available for free on their website, uh, and what they did was they created um, some information called uh, for the Bard and the Paladin, a couple of additional subclasses. And it kind of struck my fancy, so I kind of wanted to uh, bring them up, talk about them a little bit, and then use them to create a couple of characters I'm going to share with you and kind of tell how I came up with that. So let's start by talking about the Unearthed Arcana itself. Again, these are two uh, additional subclass. They're just built out, they're not really balanced in any way. If you play Adventurous League, they're not permitted in that. So this is something basically get with your DM and see if you know they'll allow you to use it or not. Um, the first subclass is the one for the Bard. At third level, you get a Bard College feature, and for them, they created the College of Eloquence. Some of the other subclasses that you get, like uh, College of Swords, are focused upon, you know, getting into combat. Others, College of Lore, are about knowing things. Uh, this particular one is designed for people who are being trained to be world-class orators. People who can speak very well, uh, use very persuasive words, very well-reasoned, able to inspire, convince, or terrify people just by what they say. So, this is the College of Eloquence on here. The first feature that you get when you get at third level is the ability of universal speech. You can talk to anybody. They can't necessarily talk back to you. You might still have to use like comprehend languages to understand what they're saying, but with a bonus action for one use of your bard inspiration, any number of creatures within 60 feet, feet, or you roll the bard inspiration die, the creatures within 60 feet all can understand you. So you've you have a captive audience. And you have advantage to charisma checks again against them, which means you can try to convince them of whatever you want, and you actually have a better chance of doing that. And this even works to things that don't speak any languages. If there are sentient plants around that don't have any kind of traditional language, you know, say you're in a sentient forest that's maybe trying to bar you entry into a sacred way because they've been enchanted by druids or something, you can use this ability and go like, uh, hey, plants, I promise we're not going to hurt you. We're not going to ruin the environment that, we're, that you're a part of while we're in here. We just need to go in, do this one thing, and we'll be out of your hair. Or leaves. And you can roll with advantage and possibly convince them to do that. Maybe there's a wall of thorns that separates at that moment. Also at third level, you gain calm emotions without spending a spell slot. What I best describe that spell is, and you'll see it in a little more detail when we go into the character building part of this, calm emotions is basically your force persuasion. 
And the College of Eloquence Bard is kind of a little bit of a Jedi, <laughs> really. Because casting calm emotions, you know, you do not want to attack me. You will leave your sword in its scabbard. We can go about our business. Move along. That's what that spell is for. You can use that if there's angry people around here, you can shut that down. And you can use that as many times as your charisma will allow. So, a few levels later, you get into the sixth feature, Undeniable Logic. The way I can best describe this is, if you've ever watched the original series of Star Trek, there is one episode where Kirk fries a computer with a logic bomb. Basically gets the computer so stuck circulating on a wrap of logic that is so paradoxical that it short circuits. You can do that with undeniable logic here. Because here's what it does. As a bonus action, you can expend one of your uses of Bardic Inspiration. You can choose any one creature within 60 feet, roll your inspiration, and die, and then do one of the following. You can make it take psychic damage, and it must succeed on an intelligent saving throw, or have a disadvantage on its next saving throw. So, again, logic bomb short-circuiting. Or, if it's somebody you like, they regain hit points equal to what you rolled on your Bardic Inspiration die, and they have advantage on their next sa saving throw, so you could potentially save someone's life that way. So, yeah, in the first case, like I said, you can basically just do something like really complicated form of logic that just fries the person's mind, something that is just so beyond their comprehension that they're like, oh god, I got a headache. Or in the latter ca case, say you've got somebody who's really low in hit points, they're poisoned, poisoned, or they're charmed, they're in serious danger. You use this, you roll your bardic inspiration die, they gain back some hit points, and they gave advantage on their next saving throw. So, in like in the case of if they're charmed, uh, during a video that D&D Beyond did, uh, stream that D&D Beyond did on this, uh, people were actually talking about uh, the effect that it would have on charms. You got someone who's in the thrall of a succubus and is in danger of potentially instantly dying from, you know, given the succubus a smooch. You use this undeniable logic on your turn. You burn your bonus action for that. They have advantage on their next, you know, saving, their next wisdom save to snap out of that. They're much more likely to suddenly realize, like, at the last possible minute, that this is a really bad idea, this is a succubus, I should run. Infectious inspiration, <laughs> the kind of virus that you don't want to be inoculated from, 14th level feature, again, uses the bardic inspiration die. A lot of these do, because that's kind of the bard's thing. Whenever a creature adds the Bardic Inspiration to their ability check, attack, roll, saving, th or saving throw, and it still fails, they keep that Bardic Inspiration die. It carries forward. So if they're in attack, they've got a Bardic Inspiration roll of 6 that they add onto their attack. And they roll like a 4. It's a 10. They don't hit you carry that six forward. But aside from that, whenever they add it and it succeeds, like say they've got the six, they're trying to attack something that's real, really burly, they roll 
an 18 on the die. It's a 24. It's a hit. Then you can use your reaction at that point to encourage someone else. <laughs> Anyone that can hear you within 60, 60 feet, you can go, yeah, good job, good job, job, Amor. Good job, Amaranth. Hey, Garthok. I believe in you. Amaranth and I, we believe in you. And that moves over, over to the den. It's really high level power. Pretty, pretty powerful. It's not capstone power, you know, like you'd get at 20, but, you know, it, it just, the inspiration hops about, and you don't expend your inspiration die for, for this. So you can basically get one use of an inspiration die spread around to the entire party as much as your charisma will allow. And then you regain them all the next day, just like with the other stuff. All right. So the other one is the Paladin's Oath. Every Paladin has an oath that they swear that is basically what they are going to be doing with the power of the gods that has been given to them. And for them, this is the Oath of Heroism. Yeah, th this is the oath that ba basically says, I am bound and determined to take the power that the gods have given me, and I'm going to do great things. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be dedicated. I'm going to be in the thick of, thick of things, ready to do whatever it needs to be done to be a hero for the people. Uh, the best description I've seen of this is, is, you know, basically this is D&D 5e. All Might. Everything will be okay. Why? Because I am here. You know, that kind of thing. So the tenets of heroism, uh, the ten tenets of them, basically the things that you hold yourself to as a result of this oath, actions over words. You know, do things. Don't talk do. It's kind of the counterpoint to the eloquence bard. The eloquence bard is all about words. Heroism is about doing stuff. Challenges are but tests. You know, it may be hard, but you're going to push through it. Embrace your destiny. You didn't choose the hero life. The hero life chose you. And hone the body. You know, make yourself the best that you can be at what you are. Be it super strong, super tough, super dexterous. Whatever kind of paladin that you're playing, you want to do that to the best of your ability as an oath of heroism. And... Like with Paladin Oaths, you get a certain list of spells that go with that. So, uh, you get Guiding Bolt, you get Enhance Ability, Protection from Energy, Haste, Enthrall, Compulsion, Freedom of mu movement, movement, and then a couple that may not make sense. <laughs> uh, Expeditious Retreat. We'll take a little look a little more into that spell later, but that doesn't really go with the tenet of pushing through adversity unless you take it from an element of, you know, a hero knows when the best thing that you can do is back away from a fight. That's the only way that I can really make that make sense in my head. But we'll take a look at that spell in particular, and we'll go into a little more of it. Maybe we'll find out a little more why they did this. Your channel divinity feature. Clerics, paladins, always get channel divinity. Did my music stop? Yes, it did.
I forgot to put it on shuffle. I forgot to put it on repeat, sorry. Yes, I use iTunes. Don't say anything in the comments. Anyway, Channel Divinity for clerics and paladins that get this. Basically, it's the direct power of your god going through you. And in this case, you can channel your divinity to augment your athleticism. Uh, when you use this as a bonus action, you will gain advantage on strength and dexterity checks for the next 10 minutes. What this reminds me of is a power that my warlock actually had in 4e, which I believe was... Um, I don't know if... It, it's a feat that I took? Yeah, it was a feat that I took for her. Um, which let her re-roll athletics and acrobatics. Which turned her from just like a typical, you know, walk around, walk around cast stuff into a warlock that could traverse the battlefield in various different way ways. You know, like hop from place to place to get exactly where she needed to be. This is kind of a similar deal for this particular... A paladin. You can get to any spot that you need need to uh, much more easily. And then once you're there, if you need to like pull something, if you need to lift some something, uh, if you need to climb something, you're going to be much more able to use that as well. And then Channel Divinity Legendary Strike is uh, what you get also. Uh, if you don't want to use the Peerless Athlete all the time, what you can do, do is use that Channel Divinity to make your weapons that much more likely to crit. For one minute, your crit range expands to 19 or 20. Now, if you're using a weapon that's already got an expanded crit, crit range, this may not work as well to you unless, you know, there are rulings that say that this can stack on there. Uh, or if your DM says that it can stack with, like, the crit range of, say, a rapier, which actually I think a rapier's crit range is like 18 to 20, 20 if I remember correct, correctly, so it already has a greater range. In that case, I would say it doesn't stack. But for most weapons, you know, it's crit on a 20 or nothing. Here... It's a crit on a 19, which takes your odds of getting a crit from 5% to 10%. They ain't great odds, but they're better than what you had. Alright. Mighty Deed, 7th level fe feature. Uh, whenever you uh, score a critical hit or you yeah, down a fo foe, you can choose any other creature that you can see within 30 feet, one or more of them, as many as your charisma allows, and then, depending on what you chose, if they're an ally, you can give them temporary hit points, you know, bolster them, because they're just so amped up by what you did that they're more likely to get stuck into the fun fight and they're going to be a little more dure, dure and they kind of got a little bit of a second wind into them or if there's somebody you don't like they have to succeed on a wisdom on a wisdom saving throw or be frightened until the until the start of your next turn so during that frightened condition they just saw what you did and like you just like cleave through their buddy and they're like oh this guy's not one to mess with I'm having none of that <sighs> and you can't use it until the start of your next turn but the one effect doesn't end until the start of the next turn anyway, so, you know, it's not really spammable, but it's something that you can still do really often, as long as you keep doing those mighty deeds. Glorious Defense, 15th level feature, 
we're getting into a pretty high level feature here. Whenever a creature you see hits you with an attack, attack roll, whenever you are being attacked and are hit, you use your reaction to gain a bonus to that AC, C equal to your charisma modifier, and potentially it can make them miss. So it's basically like they think they've got you dead to rights. They're swing, they're swinging in, and there's just something about you. In a flash, like a blink of an eye, that either unsettles them or gets to them in some way that they possibly just like veer away at the last second. At least that's me cinematically trying to think of it. I'm a very cinematically focused person. And if that attack misses, you get a shot back at them. So it's not just that, you know, they can potentially like veer off at the last second. You can come right back at them and punish them for their audacity. And then last but not least, we have the capstone ability for this particular oath, the living myth. And what this is, if you think back to the surfetched build and the legend of Sir Alium, who was uh, a paladin of Shantea uh, on there, a green knight of Shantea, uh, very much of a heroic person. Well, a paladin who maybe is also a Shantea could challenge people like Sir Al Alium to give them a bonus. Here's what it does. You are blessed with otherworldly comeliness, gaining advantage on all charisma checks, which, you know, much like with the bar, Bard of Eloquence, you're suddenly a lot more persuasive than you were. Although, to be fair, with the Oath of Heroism, you're more about actions than, than deeds, so you're going to be less about trying to talk them down and more about just, like, standing there looking awesome and scaring them. Once on each of your turns, when you make a weapon attack, attack and miss, you can make that attack hit instantly. This is why it's a capstone ability. It's very powerful. Over the course, over the course of ten minutes, while this living myth is active, you do not miss. You can choose not to miss. Now notice you can't make it a critical. It's just a straight up regular damage hit. But you don't miss. Ever. And much like that, the third point. If you fail a saving throw, you can use your reaction to make that succeed. So, say, miracle of miracles, someone manages to get you down while this ha while this is active. And let me grab a d20 just for the sake of illustration purposes here. So you got your d20. You're about to roll your your death save. You roll it. It's a six. It's a failure. Normally that would be one strike. But you're being empowered by a legend of your g god's past. You can take a look at that six and say, I think I'll make I think I'll make that a ten. I think I'll make that a success. And that means you don't die that turn. Or you are not actively dying that turn. Now again, you can't, you know, use that in such a way where you automatically, you know, like, get back up into a fight. But still really powerful because it can save you from a lot of situations. It can save you 
from being enthralled by a succubus. It can save you from being atomized. There are so many situations which having the ability to automatically say, no, I do not fail this role, can save your character's life. That's why it's a capstone. That's why it has been held off to the very last possible moment. Because if this were even earlier, this could break your game very easily. And granted, I'm a rules like kind of a person. There are times that I will just push aside the rules for the sake of doing something cinematic with my players. And even then, I am okay with leaving this as the highest possible power for this kind of paladin. But enough talk about, you know, the powers themselves. I said earlier, I wanted to create characters with it, because I want to see what it would look like if you made characters that were designed to either A, be just the biggest, most bombastic or orator, so charismatic as if to be magical, or to create someone who's just so dedicated to becoming a hero, even they're the kind of person you wouldn't necessarily look at and think, yeah, they're a hero. So, I created a couple of characters, and we're going to start with the paladin here. Say hello to Stotheles. He is a tiefling, third level paladin. And I rolled every single one of these stats using these tiny little d6. They are great for a great many things. I bought them in hopes that I might actually be able to play a game of Fiasco, and maybe at some point on this particular show we'll talk about that, especially if I ever get to play a game of Fiasco. But. They're also really good for stat generation purposes. So you look at his stats and you can see his stats are pretty even across the board. Uh, strength and Charisma are both at 16s because that's what you want for a Paladin. You want those to be pretty bolstered. He's also got a really high Constitution, also at a 16. And there's a reason for that. We'll get into that a little bit later. It kind of goes into some decisions that I made in regards to uh, Stoffelees' backstory, but we'll get into that. Dexterity, decent for, uh, well above average, 14. Intelligence and Wisdom, both an above average 12. Not a single stat is in negatives, and yes, I want to reiterate, I did roll these. So, Got a plus two initiative, not the best initiative, but a pretty good initiative. An armor class of an 18, 31 hit points, uh, resistance to fire damage because he's a tiefling, and outright immunity to disease as a paladin. As far as saving throws go, got proficiency in wisdom and charisma uh, per the class. So plus three to wisdom saves, plus five to charisma saves. Nice. Uh, passive Perception and Passive Investigation are both at 11. Passive Insight is at 13 because he has Proficiency in Insight, Athletics, Intimidation, and of course, Religion. Fluent in all kinds of armor, fluent in basically every kind of weapon in existence. Languages, uh, Common and Infernal, as per the Tiefling's usual, but also Abyssal and Celestial. So he can talk not only to his fellow tieflings or to just everybody in general, but if he needs to talk to an angel or a demon or a devil, he can. Alright. Uh, primarily wields a great sword. The reason for this Gave him great weapon fighting, so he doesn't always uh, use the shield. He's got a great weapon. Also has a warhammer, which is a versatile weapon, which also synergizes with great weapon fighting. 
um, but he can also use that one-handed with the shield, thus the 18 armor class. Uh, some javelins for distance. And of course, a fairly decent unarmed, unarmed strike if it comes to that. Um, divine Sense with the Paladin can detect good and evil. All right. Uh, lay on hands, you know, help help boost or help to cure disease. Uh, the aforementioned uh, bits of channel divinity and the spells. Uh, tieflings automatically get hellish rebuke and thaumaturgy at third level. Uh, thaumaturgy, it's a good utility spell to have. You can boost your voice, you can create flick, fire, you can create just like a little tremor in the ground, uh, you can send out a sound somewhere to trick somebody into thinking that something's happening in a different direction, uh, you can open and shut doors, or you can change the appearance of your eyes. And as for the aforementioned Hellish Rebuke, that's an attacking spell, you basically just summon the fires of hell, literally, to consume whomever it is, is that is in your way, and is automatically cast at second level. This. As for the spells that they have regularly uh, prepared as a paladin, paladins know a lot of spells, but there are a few, you have like three that you can keep prepared. For him, I've got Cure Wounds, of course, for a little bit of healing. Uh, Guiding Bolt, every Paladin's fav favorite spell, usually on there automatically. Uh, and per the Oath of Heroism, again, Expeditious Retreat. I said we were going to talk about that, and here's where we talk about it. Expeditious Retreat. The spell allows you to move at an incredible pace when you cast a spell, then as a bonus action on each of your turns until the spell ends. You can take a dash action. So again, this is designed to help you get the hell out of dodge. You know what would be a good class or subclass to have this? Arcane Trickster Rogue. You know what class I don't associate with Expeditious Retreat? A paladin who, by their own very tenets, is dedicated to pushing through adversity. And again, I can kind of somewhat see the logic of, you know, sometimes the most heroic thing to do to do is to save someone and get the hell out. It still kind of clashes with the tenants. Just a bit. Just a teeny bit. Um, I mentioned great weapon fighting on here. You can reroll a one or two on damage dice with weapons wielded with two hands. So for the great sword or for the warhammer, hammer. Basically, they are never doing minimum damage. Um, let's go back to the weapons here, and I'll show you. Okay, so you have the great sword here, two d six damage. It's going to be as hard as hitting weapon at the cost of not being able to use the shield. So, let's get some dice out here for a little uh, little uh, kind of visual aid here. You got your 2d6. You roll them. And I actually rolled a 7 there, so that would have been fine. You, that doesn't trigger two weapon fighting. But, okay, that was a 6 and a 4. Four. Would you cooperate with me, Dice, for the sake of this illustration, please? Thank you. Okay. So, here's what I rolled. Six and a two. But I got great weapon fighting. I can re-roll this, too. It becomes a four. So ten plus three, thirteen damage. That's how, to we that's how great weapon fighting works. 
thank you dice for being cooperative. And of course we went through all the various different features there for the uh, Oath of Her Heroism. Um, other features of the Tiefling you can see in Darkness. Uh, and I did mention the resistance to fire damage and the immunity to disease as being a paladin. So, for the background for this one, I decided to go with the Acolyte. Here's the reason for this. Tieflings are creatures who, at some point in their ancestry, their family, someone in their family, took a look at a devil and decided, I'm going to tap that. So they have infernal blood running through their veins. They have li they've literal literally the blood of the devil running through them. But this guy he's a little he's a little odd duck. And with any race, of course, you've got your good guys. You can have your bad guys of any race, okay? This guy is particularly devoted to the god. Hang on a second. Yelmater. Yelmater is the is a lawful good god of endurance, which is why the high constitution. And he decided to, he became a devotee of Elmater, uh, went into the ministry, decided to train to become a paladin, and was inspired by a hero of his faith to become a shining example of a hero who will stay there and defend, you know, defend the innocent on there. So... He's lawful good. His god is a god of endurance. And he's an oath of heroism pal. Paladin. And that's kind of what I figured out for him. So I figured he's an acolyte because, again, brought up in a temple of Ilmater, becoming a paladin to look up to this particular hero. And his personality traits, um, he believes that the gods are always speaking. Uh, and he's always looking for portents and signs. Uh, as previously mentioned, he's got a hero of the faith that he looks up to. Uh, the bonds that he has, everything he does is for the common people. He is there to defend the people who cannot defend themselves. He is a hero, through and through. And per his as aspirations, he seeks to prove himself worthy of Vilmi, there's favor, by matching his by matching the actions to the teachings of Vilmater, and again, with that idol, idol worship of his hero, trying to live up to that example. Um, but there is one flaw with this. Whenever he picks a goal, he focuses hard on it, and sometimes other things in his life get pushed aside. He is so devoted to becoming the kind of hero that he, his idol once was, that some other very important things in his life might end up getting pushed aside. And, you know, this background stuff, it seems, you know, it's unmechanical. Some would see it as fluff. I see it as opportunities. I see it as opportunities, one, for you to get into the headspace of the character that you're creating, but also for your dungeon master to know or to get some ideas of what they could possibly do with this character. It's like what I said about the background of the haunted one, uh, back when I was doing the build of Sadra Darkstar. 
it's all about story hooks. It's all about things that you can look at on the character sheet or your DM can look at the deck character sheet and go, this could go somewhere. And I think I know how that might go. But this, again, is the Paladin. This Paladin is built, you know, to be so charismatic that people might miss, might miss him, not be able to hit him. I'm of the opinion, uh, just because of the kind of characters I play, that it's far better to be so charismatic that people don't even want to draw the sword to begin with. So I set out to make a character for the Bard of Eloquence that is so devoted to this college that their persuasion abilities are pretty doggone close to magic. And, parade joke from old, old times of d and I didn't coin this, I don't know who coined this, but it's been kind of a joke joke for uh, tabletop fans pretty much ever since such characters have existed I give you the Charismancer. Now for this one instead of going against the grain like I did with the Paladin I decided to go for something a little more accurately fitting so I went with uh, one of my favorite races the Half Elf. Third level Bard and as you can see here with the stats again I rolled these stats. The most important things to note here are that de dexterity is a very respectable 15, but charisma is as high as it can be. With the racial bonus, it's a 20. So, this guy's not really going to be focused on fighting that much. Because, why fight when you can prevent a fight in the first place? On 24 hit points, pretty good number of hit points. 13 armor class, a little squishier. But again, the point is to not need to worry about that. So, I mean, you can see here... Just with expertise and charisma, plus seven on the charisma saves. Plus 14 to perception, plus 14, uh, 14 passive insight, 13 investigation. Pretty sharp little boy. And uh, just a brief note of calligraphers' supplies. There's a reason for that to be in there, and we'll get into that when there, there's a background, because I, I chose it for a particularly, uh, at least I think, ingenious reason. So, per a bard, you know, demi-proficiency in damn near everything, everything gets an additional plus one to it, including things that are less going to be lesser used. Uh, like athletics or such, uh, things that they're probably going to try not to have to use as much as possible. But we've got proficiency in insight, intimidation, and investigation, and perception and performance, which make those pretty formidable, especially the charisma-based ones like intimidation and performance. And then we have the two in which we have expertise. Deception and Persuasion. So, on the one hand, we have Expertise and Deception, meaning you can all, meaning that for the most part, you are going to be able to make most people believe whatever you want them to believe. I mean, even it, even if you roll, like, an average deception check, like, if you roll a 10, like, around a 10, or a 9, or 11, 
there's a good chance somebody's going to believe the yarn you're spinning. And on the other side of it, we have persuasion, which again, it's partially about making people believe what you're, what you're saying. But this can be especially good in cases where you're trying not to lie. If something happens, say, you're in a case where you're being framed for a crime that you didn't commit, and you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you're innocent, Break out this check at a key moment on there. And even with a half-decent roll, you know, just like average roll, there's a good chance that somebody, maybe even somebody important, is going to hear what you're saying about the situation and think, Oh, that makes sense. We've been looking at this wrong all along. And you combine that with the uh, proficiency and in insight side on there, proficiency with investigation, the proficiency and perception. And you've got someone here who can very accurately assess a situation and then get you out of it. So, again, attack, plus four, plus four to attack on there, using finesse weapons because the dex is higher on there. But like I said, we have calm emotions. You attempt to suppress strong emotions in a group of people. Each humanoid in a 20-foot radius spare, spattered on a point you choose within range, must make a charisma saving throw. A creature can choose to fail the saving throw if they wish. And you can use this a certain number of times a day equal to your charisma modifier. Fire. So up to five times a day and then you refresh it. It goes against your spell DC, which for this person is a 15, which is pretty tough save. If they fail that saving throw either by choice or by roll, yeah, they are charmed or you can render them indifferent to whomever they were mad at. So if there's a situation where there's a couple of people who are bickering at each other and it's about to blow us, you would step right into the middle of it and be like, nah, -uh, calming emotions. And say they both roll their sa saving throws. They don't make make the spell DC. Everybody's friends again. Alright. And I mentioned Bardic Inspiration there. I didn't mention what it normally does. What it normally does is it just gives you a little boost to your attack, saving throw, skill check, check or something. Uh, it's a single roll on there. Just a single d6 roll. roll is what it is. That's all that is. And of course we mentioned universal speech on there. Let's go into the spells that I've got on this guy. Uh, prestidigitation, again, useful utility spell, and of course, the Bardic Classic, Vicious Mockery is a can cantrip, because if you've got a Bard who likes to talk a lot, why not give, give him the ability to literally insult someone to death? Alright, then, for spells, I kind of uh, veered pretty heavily into the idea of, you know, being the most convincing person on the battlefield. So, charm person, you know, that goes along, along with that. Wis a 15 wisdom save on that. Uh, disguise self. You can become another person, go into a situation, persuade them of anything, <laughs>
he hideous laughter. Whether or not the jokes they tell are funny or not, you can make someone laugh uproariously until it literally hurts them. Okay, well, not literally hurts them, but at the very least, they're out of your hair for a while. And then, of course, you can cast Charm Person up, up a level. Detect Thoughts. Here's the reason why I went with this. And again, it goes back to some of the stuff I was doing uh, in the D&D Beyond uh, server on there and then on the Discord later uh, with one of the moderate moderators there. We were trying to figure out what would be the appropriate classes to have if you wanted to do kind of a high fantasy noir setting. Uh, Investigator Rogue is one of them. Uh, my Justice Cleric was another one that we suggested because there's a lot, a lot that's there about you know the ad expertise and insight. And then you have the Eloquence Rogue, who come in and they can help out with the insight check here with something like this with Detect Thoughts. You can look into their mind. And see what it is that they're thinking. So, if for some odd reason the Justice Cleric's insight check misses something, you can just bypass that altogether and look into their mind and see what they're thinking at that moment. And they might be thinking, okay, oh god, oh god, what do I say? What do I say? Uh, gotta think of something to deflect from the fact that I did this thing. Something like that. Then there's Suggestion. Yeah. Suggestion. You can make somebody do... You can kind of send a thought into their head and make somebody do something. Now, it can't be something, like, outright harmable to themselves. You can't suggest somebody off a cliff or something like that. But something reasonable. So you can kind of send a thought into their mind that says something like, drop your weapons, or you see them going for their sword about to attack you, you can you can use an action to cast this and be like, do not draw your weapon, we're not here to hurt you. That's what that's about. And then, Zone of Truth. I love this spell so much. I take it every chance that I get to get Zone of Truth. Because, you know, while you're in that zone, unless you manage to make the Charisma saving throw on it, which it's a saving throw of a 15 you gotta make, which is, again, not an easy task in 5e, you cannot lie. You cannot tell something that is not true. You can try to be evasive. You know, you can, you know, try and talk around it, possibly. But some way or another, be it through this, through detect thoughts, or through someone else's insight check, the truth will come out. Alright. All right. So, um, yeah, moving into uh, the background stuff that I mentioned. This is another instance where I created a background from scratch. Um, which you can do on D&D Beyond. You can kind of cobble together features from two. In this case, I believe that I took uh, that I took Noble and Folk Hero, and I cobbled them together into Infamous Orator. Right, and uh, just. Basically, what that means is that you are someone who is known for your gift of gab. 
you are someone who is known for being able to talk your way into or out of a situation. You're well versed in debates, you're well versed in philosophy, you know, you've got a sharp mind, you're insightful, and everyone is just remarked, remarkable. Everyone is just gobsmacked whenever you try, whenever you're saying you're in a mood to say stuff to people. And as part of the folk hero, um, what I gave was one additional language proficiency, a couple of skill proficiencies, and a tool. This is where the aforementioned proficiency in calligrapher supplies goes, because with this kind of bard, you don't really need an instrument like the dulcimer flute or horn that I had given uh, to the charismancer. But I did think of something else possibly that the bard of eloquence might be useful for. Contracts. If you've ever seen uh, any of the uh, Acquisitions Incorporated stuff, in particular Acquisitions Incorporated, the C Team, you know that uh, in that particular world, that organization tends to have a handful of roles that the people in the party can handle, can do. One of them is the Documancer, which is basically magical notary. And this would be a perfect fit for the Documancer role, because you have someone who is so well versed in language to have calligrapher supplies on hand, they could draw up like the most ridiculous contract that is completely beneficial to whomever party that you're partial to and not the other party that you're doing with and make it look so convincing that the party who is being disadvantaged cannot argue with it and will just sign it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, if you're playing like an Acquisitions Incorporated style, style game on there, or something of, you know, similar light nature on there, you've got yourself a Documancer with an infamous orator, uh, especially if they're an eloquence bard. And again, the traits um, I took from nobility here on this. Uh, so, my eloquent flattery makes everyone I talk to feel like the most wonderful and important person in the world. I thought that made sense for a uh, bard of eloquence. I take great pains to always look my best, best and follow the latest fa fashions. Again, I figured that made sense sense for a bard of this type because you know they're gonna they're gonna want to look as good as they think they are <laughs> you might have someone who's you know maybe there might be teens of narcissism in there just saying um, as for ideals for this one I just put independence because of the noble ones that was the one that I kind of felt made sense to it, although you can really pick any of these on here for depending on what you're going for for a Charismancer. I like playing good characters. Chaotic good may maybe in this case, but I like playing good characters. Uh, as far as bonds go, uh, this again goes back to uh, it being partially about the folk hero and getting the feature of rustic hospitality as a result of that. You know, the common folk must see me as a hero for people. This kind of person, again, it kind of kind of crosses over with the heroism paladin a little bit. But, you know, any one of these might be able to work depending on the kind of bar that you're picking. I just picked this one because I wanted to create a chaotic good uh, bar of eloquence. And, of course, coming back to the narcissism, the flaw is that... In fact, the world does revolve around me. So again, bringing in that narcissist. 
and Ma in there. That was the only one I thought made sense with this particular background with this particular character. So there you have it. There you have the uh, both the Charismancer and uh, Stoffelis, the Heroism Paladin. And uh, if you want to get this on Arthur Arcana, look over it yourself. Uh, see what you want to do. It's available on D&D Beyond as long as it's uh, still still in UA. And uh, you know if it ends up coming out in the book at some point. It'll be available in a book on D&D Beyond. Um, but for right now, it's free downloadable pal PDF uh, available on Wizards website. I've got it up here. I'll put a link in the description so you can look at all this information. And of course, I'll have the character sheets for both Stoffelis and the Charismancer down there as well. But for right now, I thank you for joining me in the theater of my mind this time. I hope you've enjoyed this performance. Until next time, the theater is closed. <laughs>